they want difference in life, but they don't want to change. It's the weirdest conundrum, right? And you have to be, here's the thing. I believe you cannot have a goal that's above your current identity because that goal means you have to handle certain things, talk in certain ways, do certain things that if you don't feel connected to those actions at an identity level, you won't do them. Therefore, you can't have that straightforward. And so you have to become more to have more. The way I look at the identity work, which has been awesome, it's like having people for the first time unpack who they are. Because we've all we've all made shifts. Either it's you it happens on demand or when crap hits the fan. And 99% of the time, it's when crap hits the fan. I'm forced against a wall. Something took place. I'm, you know, I'm running out of money. So we're forced in that manner. But I go, no, there's a way to do it intentionally. And so I kind of went back and unraveled myself, people I've worked with, and started looking at some congruencies of what are the things that people do. And I created this method that's been great for so many people to either make more money or fix their marriage or improve their health. And it's for anything, because it's, again, actions that create an outcome for you. This is the Business of Advice podcast, where we help good advisors become great business owners. Everyone, I am excited for our guest today to give you a little background. Anthony Trucks is a former NFL athlete, America Ninja Warrior, international speaker, host of the Shift podcast, huge online influencer with just hundreds of thousands of followers and the founder of Identity Shift Coaching. Uh, give you a little more, more background, and we're going to get into his story today, but after being given away into the foster care system at three years old, being adopted into an all-white family at 14, losing his NFL career to injury, and a lot more, he learned how to shift at a very young age and has been perfecting that. And now his life mission is teaching others how to make that shift happen in their own lives Anthony, welcome to the Business of Advice podcast. Excited to have you on today. Thank you for having me, man. I'm looking forward to having a chat. I, I hear good things about you too, man. So it's mutual it, in terms well, of Well, and we should probably give a shout out. My Our, our mutual buddy, Rory Vaden, said you guys got to connect. And um, he Twice. was telling me, yeah, he was telling me your story. And then I read, read your book. So Identity Shift, everyone <laughs> should buy it also. It's a great book. Um, awesome. But let, let's jump in. And I, I'll maybe ask this first question just so you can give people background. I know I said a little bit of it, but mm -hmm. NFL athlete, American Ninja Warrior, speaking all over the place. Uh, that side of your resume, I guess, paints this very positive, optimistic picture of mm -hmm. Anthony Trucks. But there's a, a, another side that has really shaped who you are that I don't know, unless people read your book, probably wouldn't know that whole story. Yeah. Do you just want to share maybe your journey of, of, of how you've got to where you're at today? Yeah, yeah. And when, but when we say other side, it's not like I was like a criminal or crazy, by the way, just in case we, you guys we should clarify that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just heard that. I'm like, I want, I, my brain all of a sudden goes, I sound like a bad guy. No. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I had my, my hard times. There's a, a painting I have in my studio and it says smooth seas never made skilled sailors. And so mm. uh, for all humanity, anybody that's paying attention and tuning in, this is like my stuff, but it's, it's all humans, man. It's all relative to everybody. And so my relative situation growing up was that I had a situation. My mom didn't want me or my siblings when I was three years old. She gave us away into foster care. And foster care is a really interesting place because back in the time, you know, this was going on in 1986, there wasn't social media, there's no television, you couldn't report situations. And so I dealt with a lot of heinous situations, beating, starving, you know, tor torture in some aspects. And so the things for me I endured were very, very hard to endure as a kid. Uh, the sad part is, is that's, that's what I thought was normal. Because when you're exposed at such a young age, what you do, you figure people starve and people get beat and they get tortured. And it's really odd. Uh, and then at some point, I was able to kind of progress through six houses, end up in my family, my forever family, we'll call it, uh, really poor, only black person in an all white family. And so I had this, you know, big 14 year stretch of my life where I didn't even know for sure if the place that I'm waking up that I get to go to bed tonight because you're one car right away from a new house every single day. So that was kind of my upbringing, man. I had a lot of um, instability. So if anybody listening goes, man, at some point in my life, I had the the lack of confidence of knowing my security in life was was good. I was stable or I had a sense of knowing or a sense of being loved or a sense of mattering. If you at any point had that, I, I know what it feels like because I started that way. Uh, however, I didn't stay that way, which is a good thing. So we're talking now. Yep. I did statistics. I progressed out to create a cool life. I think, um, you, you know, you're you're known for this idea of how do you create these shifts in your life. And mm -hmm. when when I read through your book, there were a couple of events that I think jumped out that that 
started you on this path of how you shift your thinking? I think one was an unfortunate situation with your mother passing. And then the other one that jumped out to me was um, there was a young girl in your high school that yeah. kind of gave this excuse out loud of being a foster kid. Maybe mm -hmm. just talk about those two situations and what you learned from those. Yeah. Uh, well, we'll start with the one with the girl in school because that was the one that was, I think, the, the critical one in a way that I didn't realize it was at the time. And for a lot of us, we have these moments take place and they're hidden in our past. and We don't realize they're there. And then somebody uncovered it for me and, and shone, shined this amazing light on like, oh, wow, that was the moment that actually made me me in some weird way. Um, but at 14, like I kind of was free to go be a new human. And I tried to do this thing called football uh, that I wanted to be great at. But like many of us, we try something new. We were met with the immediate reality that we're not that great because it's brand new to us. Right. And so in that moment, we typically go like, oh, I'm gonna make a good, good excuse to not do it because I don't want to be subjected to the emotional pain of not being good. And I checked out of football. I love this thing, but wouldn't do it anymore because I didn't like the pain of it. So two years go by of trying it. I'm out. And I'm in this class, Mr. Howe's English class, back right corner of this uh, this classroom in a desk with a black parka over my head, kind of half in, half out of sleeping, not doing any homework, pretty much checking out. And these two girls are sitting in a love seat next to me. I don't know who they are. I wish I could recall their names. They're talking to each other. No idea I'm over, you know, listening to them and eavesdropping. And one girl says to the other girl, the reason I'm so bad is because I'm in foster care. And it really, at face value, it's just a statement, right? It's not a big deal. But what many don't know is that in that moment, my excuse for checking out was I'm a foster kid, man. I'm not going to have, I'm not supposed to have good things in life. Like my own mom didn't love me. I was, you know, adopted in this family. I don't even look like this family. I'm nobody. I'm just this guy, right? I, I'll be lucky to have a decent job. And so when I heard that, that statement, I go, ooh, I don't like that, man. That excuse is not one that when you hear it spoken out loud feels good. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of us, we have the same thing. It may be like, oh, I didn't go running today. Why? Well, I couldn't find my running shoes. Well, they're in your house. Get up and go look more. Like, <laughs> it's a dumb excuse, you know? And so I, I went home and I kind of, I, I had this weird, like, like, you know, pit in the bottom of my stomach. And I go, oh, I remember looking in a mirror and, and having this conversation transparently to myself, pupils in my eyes. And I go, Anthony, you're going to be great. And that was the catalyst, man. It was just that singular moment. And it really happened that way. I just, it is, I'm not buttering it up to make it sound good. I was a little 15 year old kid, like, Anthony, you're going to be great. Like, you know, I just talking to myself. And that was the thing that put me on a trajectory towards doing a whole bunch of cool stuff in life. Uh, the other moment was the, my mom passing. Now, my adoptive mom, when I turned 14, was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And in between these windows is a good 15 plus years. And so in that 15 years of journey of, you know, getting us college scholarship, going to college, having a kid, meet my biological dad, going to the NFL, out of the NFL, having a business, tanking the business, getting married, getting divorced. I mean, I lived a lot of life, a small <laughs> window of time. And at a certain point when this took place, I was like checked out again. I was like, man, this, this, is, this life thing is hard. Like if this is life after the game of football. I don't want any part of it. Mm. And so there was this window where I just kind of floating. And my mom, she couldn't get out of bed. She couldn't do anything. Yet I could walk, talk, move, run. And I had this moment when she was passing of a reality of like, this woman is why I'm not in jail. Statistically, 75% of prison inmates in America are former foster kids. It's a crazy high number. Yep. So she's the reason I beat these odds. And I'm not living my life in a way that is honoring the effort that she gave to my life. And so when she passed, I'd made a promise too. In fact, one promise was I'm going to fix my life. I didn't know what it looked like yet, but I was going to fix it. And when I did, I was going to find a way to give that back to the world in some way that was comparative to what she had done for me, to love unconditionally. And so that started me out on a new path of uh, fixing my life again and then helping other people fix theirs. Well, it's uh, it, I'm glad you honored it. Obviously, you're now having a huge impact, so it's it's great to see. Uh, so, so maybe there's a common starting ground. A, a lot of what you talk about is this idea of an identity shift. Will you yeah. just uh, define maybe what you mean by identity? Identity is who you are when you're not thinking about who you are. It's, it's this tangible, intangible thing. Because if you think about it, our life is comprised of the actions that we take. That's mm -hmm. it. You do actions, you did this stuff, and there's outcomes. The actions are driven by conscious and subconscious, but also by identity. Who you see yourself to be in an active motion we aren't typically thinking about who we are. We're just doing things. Someone cuts us off. You, I'm, I'm a mad person. I'm, I'm enraged, right? Or I'm a patient person. That's okay. I'll get there at the same time. You know, it's a matter of how do you show up. And it's not when you're consciously thinking about who you are, it's just how you live. So your life is comprised of the actions you take based on the identity you have in place. So one of the things I want to ask you about, so we, we work with these incredible financial advisors. Um, 
and, and what I see a lot of times, and myself you know, included in this, is it's very easy to have our identity wrapped up in work. Uh, yeah. You know, and that can be being an entrepreneur, being a business owner. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you, you had this stretch even in your life, played college football at Oregon, go into the NFL. I think there was a stretch where you probably viewed your identity as, you know, being a football player. Oh, yeah. um, what are the pitfalls of having your identity wrapped up in your work? And then w what mm -hmm. are some like tangible steps people can take to to not have their entire identity wrapped up in their work? Yeah. When your identity is your work, it's always dangling off a cliff, man. It could always be cut off because someone could fire you. You could lose a job for some, you know, cut off or something. Maybe all of a sudden, you know, something happens. You just don't you don't love the job anymore. And you start questioning your entire existence, you know. And I did this when I was a football guy. I was a football guy. And then at one point I had this injury that ended my football season that year and then eventually my career. And it ended up being this thing where I had a lot of just this, this anger and this confusion inside of who am I? Where is my self-worth? And it's because this, this metaphor, which is actually in the book, it's about this concept of a tree. And I found that football was the fruit of my labor, right? I, I was football and I was this apple. Mm -hmm. And when the apple fell off the tree, like like any kind of fruit, it can last for a couple of days, you know, maybe some weeks. After a while, though, it will rot. So for me, I was good for a couple of weeks, a couple of months. After a year, I was like, oh, I hate me. Who am I without football? And that that souring starts to poison everything around it. And that's kind of what happened. I poisoned my life. And it wasn't until like three years later when I finally had this realization after divorce, living in this 500 square foot studio apartment with my kids on an air mattress sleeping next to me, my business in shambles up and down, almost bankrupt all the time, literally like borderline for years. I realized some odd thing was, you know what? I am not football. I am never, the, I've never been the fruit of my labor. None of us have. In fact, as opposed to being the fruit, I've always been the tree. And all of us have. Like I am the thing that created the fruit of football, created the marriage, created the kids, cre all these things. And I go, you know what? What actually happened was when the fruit fell off the tree, I lost sight of the rest of the tree. So I didn't prune the branches, give it nutrients, put it in the right soil, take care of the rest of the fruit. So of course it all died. And the reality is when you go back and take care of the tree, you can actually create sweeter and more abundant fruit. But most of us are so focused on this one piece of fruit that we, we don't realize that you still are a tree. And if that one fruit doesn't do well, or even if it does do well, the absence of focus on the rest of it, it all falls apart. And so if you're a, anything, say you're a person in financial services, if that's all that matters, go ahead and make a bunch of money. Who are you going to go home and celebrate with? Make a bunch of money. You're going to have a heart attack in six years. Make a bunch of money. Your kids going to love you. Do you. Not even a present father. Kids don't want to call you on the holidays. It's all good and well, but none of that is worthwhile when you look at the holistic. Mm. Yeah. Um to, to me that you, you gain this self-awareness around who you are, you know, what your identity is rooted in. Yeah. How, um, some of the things that jumped out to me, you, you talk a lot about the role that friends, family play in helping you understand your true identity. Maybe yeah. just talk to that a little bit. Yeah. So we're, we're all images, right? We're images that are mirrored off of other people. And there's this statement, I think it was a guy named Tom Murphy said, and he says, it's hard to see the label when you're inside of the jar. And I, I like this statement a lot because I go, oh, we're, we're all operating our jars going, why is this jar empty? You know, why is this jar um, not fulfilled? Why is it not at peace? And it's like there's a label outside that says, well, you're a poor communicator or you're lazy or uh, maybe you, you don't play well with others, you know. And so we don't know that, but we just keep operating our way. And what's good is when you have people in your life that will tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear, it helps you understand better who you are. And if you can pull your ego aside long enough to actually listen It'll give you intel that can allow you to go, ooh, you know, I don't want to identify as that anymore. Because at some points, you know, you you may identify as, uh, like for me, like in my marriage, for example, I'm the guy, I don't I don't apologize, it's not who I am, you know, or I don't show this side of me, that's not who I am. And now I'm like, not who I am. Because that makes my life better. If I tell my wife what's going on, or I communicate openly, or I don't have to hold this ground and be alpha, that, that gives me breathing room. We have, I get more from her, because I'm giving more to her. And so to detach from certain identities when they're made apparent to you makes your life better because it's not about trying to, to be something that you see in your head. It's about being the thing that operates well in this world because here's the big thing. The world's a mirror to us. How we, how we show up out, like what we give out of ourselves, yep. the world reflects back to us. If I give you love, you give me love. If I, if I hit you in the face, you're going to hit me in the face, right? It's this, the thing. So if you're giving something out, expect to get it back but it better be something good so you can desire to get it back. 
one of the other big things you talk about is just the role that habits play in, in either creating or mm-hmm. sustaining this identity shift. Talk, talk about maybe healthy habits that you've seen um, mm-hmm. entrepreneurs, leaders, you know, yeah. implement into their life to, to really make a positive shift. Yeah. You know, here's the interesting thing. They're always different. I, I find that I try to like come up with like, what are the core ones? But everybody's world is different, but it's experiences are different religions are different beliefs are different so with that i go okay well let's just pause and think about it i think that there's i'm going to leave this this end part that goes uh, the quote of you're the average of the the five people you surround yourself with and i, I want to take it a step further i go i believe the average of the expectations of the five people you surround yourself with so for me it's more about the people that i'm around what are the expectations they have of themselves and of myself and so can i hold myself to this area where i find that's where i want to be because the expectations that I have of myself might be different from yours or from my family or from colleagues, right? So find that, that we'll call it that group, that tribe that you you love the expectations they have for maybe integrity and honesty and work ethic. And like, I don't like being around guys that talk about their wife like they're uh, some ball and chain. Like, that's not how I function. I love my wife and my family. Or people that go like, work all day, hustle, 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 never, you know. I'm like, yeah, it sounds good, but like, I want to work enough to enjoy the things that I'm working <laughs> for, you know? So find that. Then once you do it, you'll understand what kind of habits because your heart will tell you. If we, if we make it lofty and soft, your heart will tell you. And here, I'm going to be here's some consistent ones. Here's what I believe to be true in some habits. One, you must start your day in control. So people that get up at an alarm clock and are spread out the door, your life starts like with your hair on fire. It's hard to put it out all throughout the day. So I get up no matter what earlier, at least an hour earlier than anything else I have in my day. So I can be in control of how it starts and I can set my tone. I can set my energy. It's a huge habit that not a lot of people do. Now, yes, you can go deeper and go, I'm going to create a very structured and regimented morning routine. I recommend doing that. But at minimum, to just get up earlier, do something in the morning so you're not feeling like you're pulled the rest of the day. The second thing is, as much as you plan your life of work, and what's important there, you would better do it for your life. So date days, dad days, workouts, eating, whatever it is, that stuff's got to be put in and as regimented and structured as possible because as people, we can hope that our emotions going to lead us, but it doesn't. No matter what you want to do today, guarantee you in a month from now, you're not going to want to do it the same manner. You may not want to do it tomorrow, right? But the idea of, of having discipline is huge. And a lot of people love the idea of discipline, but they're trying to be disciplined to emotions as opposed to being disciplined to a plan. Because disciple means to follow, plan, yeah. plan, follow a plan. If you have no plan, can't stay disciplined so make sure you have some structure that puts those things in and then the third thing that for me like i guess the bigger habit of what i keep in place is i'm really heavily built on relationships like all my life is is colleague relationships or intimate relationships or friendship relationships and all of these things the studies show time spent with people is what develops amazing relationships and most people don't realize that the reason your relationship is so addicted to work is because you've made time for it so if you do the same thing for your friends, your family, my brother's in Germany right now, and we meet every two weeks on a Saturday. We don't have to, but I go, I want to make sure I'm still close to my brother. So every two weeks on Saturday morning, it's 8 a.m. my time, like 5-ish p.m. his time. We talk for about 30 minutes to an hour on whatever we feel like talking about at that moment in time. Same my best friend, my wife, my kids. And so I make time, even if it's once a week or once every two weeks, because all the stuff I'm doing professionally, getting up early, folks on work, all that's that's great. But if I have no one to share with, I am unfulfilled in life and I've been there. So habitually, I focus on those three things as best I can is how can I start my day in control? How can I structure my life to where I can be disciplined to it? And in fact, doing this helps you free flow because we as humans are really great in flow. But we sometimes get into flow and we question if we should be doing something else. To create this regimen removes the questions. You stay more in free flow and three schedule things that you have in place for people you love so you can develop amazing relationships. Those three great habits. <laughs> Hopefully everyone takes us if they're not doing them and implements them. Um, w- w- one of the things, we, we were actually talking about this a little bit before we, we started recording, and just get your thoughts on it. So one of our four founding principles that we started our company on was we want to surround ourselves with the best. And for us, what that means is these advisors we support, we're constantly trying to create these these learning-rich environments to have them come learn from others. I was mentioning we just had Ed Milet a couple weeks ago. Uh, you're coming off a mastermind where you were with some other really influential people. 
would you just talk, I, I know you've talked about that idea of the five people you surround yourself with, but yeah. how have you seen something like that, the, that, that mastermind group you're in as an example, impact you in a positive way? And, and how important is that for people? Yeah, well, it's kind of like this feeling where you, you walk into some rooms and you know you're like the, uh, you don't need the head of the room. And then it's almost, it's comforting, but it also has a little bit of like, you miss that challenge. I think we as humans like challenge. I think it's a natural part of us. That's why we like puzzles. We like playing games because we like the challenge of it. Because as soon as the puzzle, the last puzzle piece goes in, I go, all right, that's good. But then I want to do the puzzle again, right? Mm -hmm. So that little, that challenge, what's good about these rooms is they put you in a position to challenge you. And it's not always a challenge of like, make more money, build more. No, it's a lot. This Just for example, this last one we did, it was a challenge on really tapping into the experience of life we're having. There were a lot more tears than I'd ever seen in this group. Mm -hmm. A lot more transparent because when you're at a certain level, you do feel alone. Your team you can't talk to. Sometimes your spouse you can't talk to. The colleagues you can kind of connect with, but we're all busy. So come to this place is an area where you can actually be like, hey, I'm going to vent. And this person isn't going to look at me and go, oh, you make a bunch of money. You're successful. What do you have to worry about? And they go, no, I, I feel the pain of you. So these rooms allow you to be human more than you could be human anywhere else sometimes because you're around individuals who get it and don't you know, shame you for, for feeling bad about how the success you've had. You know, it's a weird dynamic to think through. <laughs> But then they also recenter you on what's important because you, when you're in your, your flow, you can get, I can get focused on like, is, are the, the videos performing? What's the view rate? How do I adjust this little intro portion? Do we make the amount of sales? What are the numbers like on that? Cause yeah, there's a business to run, but when you get to these groups, it, it helps you center back to the reason we're really here and really gets to serve. It's really it. Like I have a creepy deep desire for two things this year. I started a speaking training company, like how to, build a speaking business. I love the idea of helping all these maybe hundred plus people bring a message to the world. And I, cause I know what it feels like to pour something out mm -hmm. and feel filled up in doing so to serve somebody from to come back, go, thank you so much for doing that. I go, man, if I can give that to somebody else with their message, Oh, I love the idea of that, you know? And so like to center back to that point is the reason I'm on a phone talking to you to get you kind of dialed in with your message. Like that's huge. And then for the people, it's like, how do I do this identity shift work? How do I get you to, to wake up one day and look back at your old self and not recognize them in the best of ways? Because that's a, a freeing, empowering place that so many people never reach in a lifetime. And so rooms like this allow you to go back to that center point and go, why are we doing this? All right, if that's what I'm doing this for, maybe I don't go trudging down this path I've been doing. Maybe there's a new way I didn't think of that they can present to me. So there's strategic aspects and personal aspects. And sometimes, man, it's just good to be around people who their hearts are bigger than most people think and to yep. reconnect with the heart part of it. Yeah, no, I see that for sure. Uh, speaking of the identity shift, you, you developed the shift method. T yeah. Talk about that method and the benefits that you've seen for people who've implemented it. Yeah, well, it's pretty straightforward. The idea is like, people don't like change. They want difference in life, but they don't want to change. It's the weirdest conundrum, right? And you have to be, here's the thing. I believe you cannot have a goal that's above your current identity. Because that goal means you have to handle certain things, talk in certain ways, do certain things that if you don't feel connected to those actions at an identity level, you won't do them. Therefore, you can't have that. Straightforward. And so you have to become more to have more. The way I look at the identity work, which has been awesome, it's like having people for the first time unpack who they are. Because we've all, we've all made shifts. Either it's, it happens on demand or when crap hits the fan. And 99% of the time, it's when crap hits the fan. I'm forced against a wall. Something took place. I'm, you know, I'm running out of money. So we're forced in that manner. But I go, no, there's a way to do it intentionally. And so I kind of went back and unraveled myself, people I've worked with, and started looking at some congruencies of what are the things that people do. And I created this method that's been great for so many people to either make more money or fix their marriage or improve their health. And it's for anything because it's, again, actions that create an outcome for you. And so for me, over the last few years, I've had a blast just putting into people's lives, having them walk through this. I work with Amazon and PayPal's and individual people and organizations and entrepreneurs. And you just have them sit there and unpack themselves in ways they've probably never done before. And then you have them face things they've never faced before. Because while we'll all face challenges, a lot of it is the challenge you have to face isn't the one you think. It's the challenge of, well, for some reason, my business won't grow. Well, why is your business growing? I don't know. I don't feel up to it. And the more you dig, you find, well, their marriage is in shambles. Mm. They find out, why is your marriage in shambles? Well, it's because if my wife or my husband doesn't feel like I'm present. I'm always working. I go, interesting. So what happens is you're, you have this energy of a fight with your spouse. So you have that. You carry that into work. 
So you're unfocused at work. You're not working from joy. And then what happens is you bring this, you know, energy there and you, un, you have unfinished work. So you bring the work home. Or if you do great, you have no one to share it with. So you feel confined in a marriage. So what happens is you aren't even able to express yourself in your marriage or in your work. Well, where's the starting point? What if you just got more focused at work? Because then if you get more focused at work and you identify as a person that could structure and, and knock things off, well, then you can come home and leave work at work, be home with your spouse. Your spouse loves you now. And now there's better energy there. You can identify as a great husband or a great wife. And then you can have full heart as you go back to work and do great work. And, and it spins different. So the, your business really isn't falling apart because your marriage, your marriage is affecting your business because your business is affecting your marriage. <laughs> you know, like yep. it's this. So, but I, I uncut and they go, oh, and then we start working on the thing that's the foundational piece of it. And so that's really the stuff we do. And in this new year, we've kind of, an odd, fun way, I realized no one woke up at any point in time and goes, man, I want to make an identity shift, Cody. Like that never happens. You know, it's <laughs> not this thing. So we started going as well. That's a great topic. And the topic is powerful, as we know. However, the message doesn't land. The, I, the shift method, people don't go, oh, I want that. Yep. So I started kind of uncovering, like, what is the thing? And then I'd been saying this thing in my keynotes for years without knowing I was saying it. And I talk about when I was 15, went from being a horrible football player to a great football player. And what it was is window of time where I did these things I didn't want to do, but I showed up in the football field with this different animal in it. And I had this mentality of, I have done too much work in the dark for you to take what is mine in the light. And it was just this anchored piece of it's my football. I'd already earned this. You don't get to take this from me. And so I realized the true key to make an identity shift, like I just mentioned, is dark work. It's the work you do in the dark that lets you shine in the light. And so this whole next progression of the year is, is actually going to the world and really kind of clarifying and giving people the work and the, the message of dark work, but also to do a dark work experience. Because at a neurological, psychological level, we're wired a certain way. And it's all through experiences we've had. If I'm happy or go lucky in certain situations, because I've experienced that. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's things you've experienced that you can handle it no problem. But I do. I go, oh, what do I do, Cody? You know, off of wiring. So I go, if we want to just become someone better, a different identity, you must rewire the same way we got wired. Experience. So that's what I do, man. Dark work experience to make people's identity shift in time. Yeah, um, it, that was one of the things I was going to ask you about. It's I, I have a friend who says that a lot too. He says the bright lights only expose the work done in the dark. You know, which mm -hmm. is just, it's. Um, uh, let me say it this way, because a lot of the advisors we support listen to this. So I'll speak a little to this audience, but I tell them all the time. You know, they'll they'll hire new advisors, and, and most of the people we work with are really good, really successful. They'll bring new advisors into their firm, and they'll get frustrated because they're not as good as them. One of the yeah. things I talk about all the time that I think we all discount. Um, the reps that are put in, right? Even yeah. you kind of said it, there's so many things that happen in business that I have friends who are like, I don't understand how you can handle, deal with that. Like, I don't know, because I've been doing it for 18 years. You know, I don't even think twice about it. Yeah. Talk about that idea. And to me, that's what dark work is, right? It's the reps yeah. that are being put in that nobody mm -hmm. see that yeah. leads you to this point where when you are on stage, you know, the bright lights are showing all this work done. So t yeah. talk about that concept maybe of just, work done in the dark, you know, the reps that are put in and how important yeah. that is. Well, for me, the big thing is it's all going to, it's going to come to a head in the moments that matter. None of it matters in terms of how we're sitting here. It's when you get challenged, you're in a, the, the heightened pressure moment. And what I found is I look at athletes to find the answer. I was an athlete. Uh, I like to think I still am. My low back doesn't though. <laughs> so, uh, but I found there's this desire like that, that when I'm in the, in the game, I want to compete with conviction. I want to have this guttural anchored soul part. You can't beat me. Right. But that has to be earned. And I realized that in the moments where I'm being challenged, think of like, the, you know, Tiger Woods, the Serena Williams, LeBron James, you know, it doesn't matter. Whoever you choose, the bigger athletes, you know, the Kobe Bryant's of the world, Michael Jordan's, um, the Wayne Gretzky's. When things got tough, and like I'm talking on the line, if you put a camera on them in the middle of the game, there wasn't this joyous, I can do it, smile on their face. What it was was this like this dark, deeper place they were pulling from. It was like almost an anger, but a useful anger. And that's what I call like dark energy because they're about to shine as best they can, but they got to pull from somewhere and that's dark energy. And that dark energy was built through dark deposits. Like he's like on dark work deposits. It's the reps in the gym. It's Kobe Bryant talking about how he went to practice before his team went to practice. Michael Jordan would shoot for hours before anybody else was there. It's Serena Williams. She's a whole documentary in her life. Right. And that that's what it was. And so I go, well, all of us want that. We talk about how great it is. And you think there's some, some trick and some strategy. There's not, man. It's the reps. 
And the way you do it is you go back to what, what did they do? And across the board, it was pretty straightforward. It was stuff that was misunderstood by many because most people go, why would you do that? It was unsexy. They did it with a lack of confidence because most of the time you're doing it without knowing what the outcome is going to be. And there was no celebration. I think a lot of people are trying to do things and get that immediate gratification. We, we click a button right now and food shows up in 20 minutes, right? We yep. want this immediate gratification. Or if we do something, we want to show the world now, look how great I am. And I think the problem is that diminishes your ability to actually put the time in to master something. See, most of these people didn't have a camera up when they were doing it. It wasn't there. It just, but they're just doing the work. And so in our world nowadays, there's so less of that. And then there's this big you know, gap of why am I not successful? Why am I not there? Because everything you want to do in the light, you're not okay just tucking back into the dark and doing it. And my, this is one where I heard this in college. My teammates, offensive lineman, I'm a football guy. If you ever think about it, how many times have you seen an offensive lineman interviewed after a game? Not very often. Not very often, right? <laughs> and so my teammates in college, got him, Ian Reynoso, good dude. And he goes, hey, he had this shirt on. It said, no sugar. I go, Ian, what, what does that mean, man? What does no sugar mean? He goes, we don't get no sugar. I go, what do you mean you don't get no sugar? He goes, as the offensive lineman, our job is to work harder than everybody else on the team. We're bigger. We can't run like you guys. But we're the ones that we do the job so the quarterback can throw the ball to the receiver. So the running back can run down the field and do his thing, and, and he can shine in the light. But we do all that work. And the biggest thing is no one really gives us credit for it. But we don't want it. We give it to ourselves. We know what we did. We know how we worked. We know how we trained. And that's good enough for us. We don't want no sugar. And I love this mentality because for me, like I live in a world now where every day I'm doing things and no one's seeing it. No one's celebrating it. Half the time my wife has no idea what I'm doing in here, <laughs> but I don't need the sugar. I give, yeah. I give myself my own little sugar and, and that's all I need because then I actually have what it takes to in the moments where I got to shine on the light, I'm on a stage in front of a camera, in front of a microphone. I go to that place. I'm like, I got this. Like, you ain't going to take my success from me. I've already worked for this. You didn't see what I did in the dark. And so no matter where you pay place that for any profession in any part of a human life, you will have work you must do that is unsexy, misunderstood. It's it's something that, that people may even ridicule you for doing. But the more you do it, the more you become the person who does it, which gives you the opportunity. Not only that, it gives you the right to take what is yours in the light. It's, uh, you know, that part reminds me there, there's good friend. I don't know if you've met Bo Eason before. Do you know Bo know at Bo. all? Uh, yeah, so Bo, yeah. Bo tells this great story about when he got traded to the 49ers in training camp with Jerry Rice the first time. Mm -hmm. And yeah. he's like, you know, all the receivers I'm are running these little 10 yard routes and they jog back. And he's like every yeah. single play, Jerry Rice would catch it and sprint. run to the end zone, sprint every to the time. end zone every single time. Yeah. But you look at that, you know, that guy, always dominated in the fourth quarter he was in better mm -hmm. shape than anyone else you know and it's just there's no there's really no surprises even though I, I think this is one of the things I see even with some um I was just having this conversation with someone I think even with the younger generation now they've been brought up in the social media area where it does look like there's these overnight celebrities or things like that and they they want to be I say this I have a young kid I've mentored for a while and you mm -hmm. know he, he thinks he should be so much further along and I'm like Man, I was like two years into my career when I was your age, you know, it, yeah. it's, I wasn't here, you know, that was 20 years of work there. So yeah. I think that's one of the things that just gets overlooked a lot of how, how much the work matters. It is. And the thing is, is that that's, that's the hard part of our world. These kids are being brought up in a world where everything matters based on what other people think of you. It's, it's very detrimental to our, our psyche. All right. Cause then we, what we do is we outsource our identity to a social media platform. My yeah. likes determine how likable I am. And it's like, no, nah, man. I can't remember the last time I did a story. My team doesn't like that very much because I'm not a big social media like hound, but we create content. I love making it, but I'm not going to think like, here's my cup of tea today, you know, because I like being in the dark. I like doing my thing. And when I do decide to show you something, it's going to be great. But these kids nowadays, that's a problem because what happens is you start getting to this point where if you don't have the success you want, it's, it's because you haven't done hard things. And then a hard thing shows up and you can't face it. Yep. And all you do is go, I should have this, but you don't have it. It's hard to, to reconcile. And then you start getting a little bit of anger. You get some spite. You get a little bit of resentment that builds up. And now you have this, well, I'm, I'm mad. And I, it's, again, the world's a mirror. I start giving that out. And I wonder why am I not making progress? Well, because you have gotten spiteful because you couldn't do the hard thing necessary. You didn't do the dark work. So you don't deserve the shine. I'm, I'm a man of faith. And there's this uh, story of Cain and Abel. 
I love it. I, I had, uh, who did I hear? I think Jordan Peterson, Dr. Peterson hmm. broke it down when, when I go, that's a really cool way of looking at it. And I kind of added my twist to it. But he goes, if you think about a Cain and Abel operated, Cain had this brother, which was Abel, and God said, give me all and I'll give you my love and support. And so what happens is Abel gives everything. Abel gives all he has. And God says, I, I'm appreciative of this. Thank you, son. And he gives him love. And then Cain doesn't give him all. And so God doesn't give him all of his love. And he goes, but I, but I, I did work. He goes, yeah, but you only gave what, what you wanted to give. I asked you for all. And so Cain's solution as opposed to leveling up is to kill his brother. That's <laughs> spite and anger, right? So if I get rid of him, then I'm the only one, right? But the reality is it's like saying, you know what? I want that, that new device that costs $100, but I only want to pay 80 bucks for it, even though you paid 100 no, it's not how the world works. You got to give everything to get anything of worthwhile. And so that, that same thing for these kids nowadays, they want to give as much as they want to give. They want to get all of the love. And it's like, that's not how it works. It'll never work that way. You must give more than you actually feel like you can give to get what you think you desire most. That's good. Hey, th that may be a transition. One kind of final Final thought I want you to talk about, and then we'll jump into a couple quick lightning round questions. Um, and, and we were talking about this a little before. I, I shared with you, had a close friend and a team member here who took his life a couple years ago. Um, you were on a path towards that at one point in time, which I, you know, you're pretty open about in your book. And, and I think just what we were talking about with kids, I, I'm seeing just these levels of, this probably wasn't on my radar until, you know, two years ago, but now just seeing the levels of of stress and anxiety and depression and yeah. COVID I know impacted that in, in big ways with restrictions and isolation and all this. But what I wanted to ask you about maybe is um, how do you control your internal thoughts and, and kind of protect your heart when, when you see and can definitely tell a story of there's these external things that, that aren't necessarily choices I'm making impacting that just, I, I think that's a valuable thing. I know you've talked about that some, how, ha yeah. how have you done that maybe over the last couple of years? So some of these external things, obviously being someone who speaks and does keynotes, you know, that had a big impact there, but just yeah. any advice you would have for people that may be struggling right now? Yeah, man. Uh, so I was in a bad place. So we backtracked about 2000 and what was that? Uh, nine, 10, 11. I might've been like, you know, it was 2011. It was August 2011. I know because at one point in time, it showed up on somebody's feed because hmm. they said, I'm looking for my friend. Can't find him. And it was because I had this overwhelming situation take place. And the word I'm going to use is overwhelming on purpose is a different word I use now. So I felt overwhelmed. I felt like this is too much to handle. Uh, my wife had stepped out on me. Uh, my business was doing poorly. I didn't have the identity of the football player. Didn't feel like a good dad. I was out of shape. And I go, I got nothing, man. I got, I'm, I'm giving everything I can. Nothing seems to be working. So I go, well, if I can't give anything more and will, the world's not getting any better for me, I might as well just end it. And so I remember like I, I drove off one night and said, please tell my kids who their father was. And I was dead set on finding rat poison. It just happened to be like 1030 at night. No stores that sold it were open. And so I just found myself driving for a couple of stores and just driving to a spot, parking at a gas station, sitting there. And the kind of the overwhelming wave of pain it subsided. And I remember like the police had pulled up and they go, Hey, what are you doing? I made some excuse. I can obviously talk. So I talked my way out of it and like just head on home. So I headed home. And I remember this kind of this driving up to my house. This was the interesting part of it. I drove up to my house. There's like 40 people sitting in front of my house. And it was the most shameful feeling to this day that I've ever experienced of like, I'm supposed to be the guy, former NFL athlete. Look how great I am. And I'm rolling up and I'm, I'm broken, man. And I think that was the biggest thing I had never thought of doing was just showing me, showing who I was. So I felt alone. I think that's the scariest part of it. When we're going through those things, we feel incredibly alone. When you have those thoughts, you feel incredibly alone. And if I don't have the solution to it, then I, all I think is like, well, the solution is to end it. And so in hindsight, what I wish I would have done was simply just said, hey, I'm really fighting something hard I can't, I can't figure out and talk to people closest to me who love me. Yep. Because it's weird, the more, I, the more I talked, the more I realized I was far from alone, man. Yep. Everybody I'd been around had experienced something like this or was in their own battle of it, just maybe not to the same capacity of it all. But like the more I talked, the more I felt like, oh, like I'm, I, have, I have hope. That was the big thing. When you're in that place and you don't think that you can have a solution and you don't think you can talk to people, no hope. There's no hope. Why am I here? To simply express gave me hope. Even little, you know, minuscule pieces of hope was enough to feed my soul, man. And the more I, I talked, the more I had some, you know, okay, here's what I can do. I would take some actions. I'd fix some things. And so it's a journey to it. But the more I did it, the better it got. And then I started getting to a point where there's a great book by Michael Singer. It's called The Untethered Soul. 
And I, and I really love the concept because it gave me a, like a pause. And what it is, he goes, have you ever found yourself sitting there going, you know, here's a choice to make. And you go, hey, what should I do? And then you go, I don't know. He says, that's another voice within you. He says, there is who you show the world and who is in your head telling who to show the world. Like, you know, like there's like a separation a little bit. Not that you're two people per se, but you have this internal dialogue you can have. And he says, at points in times, you have to analyze how you are thinking, which is affecting how you show up to the world. So you step back into yourself. And so for the first time almost ever, I was analyzing my thoughts. I was thinking about how I was thinking, if that makes sense. So now when I have moments that take place, I'm not going to lie, this last week has kind of sucked. <laughs> like it's been a lot of crazy that all of a sudden just hit me like a ton of bricks, man. And I'm just trying to breathe through it. And I, I spend time analyzing my thoughts because me, I want to freak out on people. I want to yell at people. And I go, but that's not what the world needs. I'm a mirror to the world. Let me step back and breathe into this and go, what, what is going on? What can you process? What can you do? How can you not operate from the emotion of it, but the logic of it? And the more I can step back and do that, the better control I can get in and the shorter that window of discomfort is. And so now in my life, what used to take me like months to get out of a funk, like I could do it in a couple hours. Step back, what's going on? Why is it, okay, Anthony, really, why is it going like that? And then I go, okay, Ant, where's your fault in this? It's mm -hmm. one question I ask myself. <laughs> hey, where's this your fault? And so like, I, just for example, I have a team that, that sells our programs of a sales call guy. And this guy, he does his thing and he goes out and he's been on a lot of calls, hasn't been making a lot of sales. And there's some reasons why. And for me, it's like, well, you're a sales guy, man. You're getting on calls, sell the product. What, what are we doing? You know? And it got to a point where I took some, some over because I want to kind of see what was going on. I figured I'd give it back to him. Well, when it was time to give it back to him, he's like, look, I, I don't feel comfortable in this anymore. I can't do this. And he stepped away immediately, left me high and dry. I'm like, I got an entire life to live. I have a whole part of the company I run and I got to take on all the sales calls now. I'm like, oh, and so in my head, I'm like, how could you, then I go, okay, well, where was my fault in this? And I go, you know what? I don't think that I took these calls on early enough. I could have helped him by getting a clear idea of what he was experiencing earlier. I could have stepped in and maybe worked on lead quality. Like how can I make sure what I'm doing in marketing is helping him in the backside. And so the moment I do that, here's the weird thing. While you do feel shame because you had control over something, you don't feel hopeless anymore. You have a sense of control of making something. You get mm -hmm. hope. And for me, that's what I want to do with everything I experience. It's hardship. I go, okay, where's my fault? Find your fault. And if maybe fault's not the world, find your responsibility with it. Yeah. And now I can go, okay, now I can navigate it and change things. And that's, that's how I move forward. So we found somebody new. And because of what I learned from that, I now have a brand new way of operating with this new person. So they're successful. And it all starts with me. That's good. And I would just um, maybe to wrap up that thing. I, I think there are I, I see and maybe just because I've been around a little bit now over the last couple of years, a, a lot of people are struggling right now. And, you know, I think there's a few things I've learned and, and you hit it really, really good is you're not alone. Right. <laughs> there's a lot of people having the same challenge as you are. And there's a lot of people that want to help. And then there's another and uh, Louis Giglio had this incredible kind of sermon message where he talked about this. But he said something that's just stuck with me, and I, I've, I've witnessed it, which is, is what has is, uh, probably made it stick. But he said, you know, suicide never eliminates pain. It only amplifies it. And that's just been something that I've, I've seen, you know, play out. And so tell everyone, if you, if you are struggling, you're not alone. Find someone that you can talk to about it because it, it makes a huge difference. And I'm sure you even, when you roll up and see all those people who are worried sick about you sitting there, you know, trying to figure out where you're at, it's a good reminder of that. So. Yeah. All right, man. Let me ask you. I know we got uh, time. We're coming up on it. So let me ask you just a couple of quick lightning round questions. These can, can be kind of short answers if you want or just whatever comes to mind uh, that I ask everyone here at the end. And the first one is this. And we talked a little bit about COVID. So I just use that as the time frame now. But mm -hmm. I, I say there's a, a lot of things that have happened over the past few years. Is there yeah. one lesson that you've taken from these past two years that you will carry forward for the rest of your career or life? Oh, yeah, man. Uh you have to shift with shifting times. That's that's the thing for me is we all know that, you know, change is the only thing that's constant. That's the thing we always hear all the time. And a lot of people like I'm getting brought in to speak to a lot of companies as they kind of venture into the new post COVID world with the same people still attached to the previous world. And and that's a scary thing because then they don't feel prepared or capable. And then they have the great resign. I'm, I would be curious to see how many of the people left the job because they didn't want to be outed for their inabilities. That mm. makes sense. Mm. Um, and I don't, I don't know. It's just, it's just a thought I have. Yeah. But I think what I've learned is like the ones that can latch on to the change as fast as humanly possible, realizing they have done something like this before 
and give yourself the ability to to understand that everyone's doing it at the same time. So you have the ability to fail a little bit along the way and not have the biggest repercussions, lose your job kind of thing. I think those people win. And you also have a sense of pride that is vastly different than you ever had because you feel confident about what you subjected yourself to and succeeded in. There, there's something magical about the moment when I didn't think I could do it, but then I do it and I have this overwhelming realization of my capabilities. And we are we are missing that because so many people are not shifting with shifting times. They're trying to hold on as long as they can to the old and then they're thrust into the new. And if you can lean into the new intentionally, you have a vast different control of your life and you actually have more success before many other people do. That's good. Okay, second question. Uh, what's the one thing that you did that graduated you from being a, a good leader to a great leader? Oh, it's a great question, man. A good leader to a great leader. Oh, dude. You know what? Um, I think for me, the biggest thing that I realized is at a point in time, I thought I was a person who was supposed to sit in the back seat of the car. You know, like, I'm, a, I'm a, you guys do this thing and I'm a leader. I'm going to tell you where to drive. Yep. And I realized, like, no, like, I'm kind of like the guy in the car, but I'm driving the car. Right. It's, it's it sounds odd, but there are a lot of people that go, look, I just I'm the leader. I've been doing this. I've made the money. I'm just going to sit back and tell you guys where to go. I'm going to lead from my ivory tower. And I go, no, yeah, at the end of the day, there's a certain thing of respect when I'm driving a car. But also I can I can take insight from where the car was going. So my leadership has kind of got to the point where I want to sit in there and I'm going to be the one that makes a final choice. But I want you to help me make the choice. I want you to give me insight because at the end of the day, people protect what they create. And when I look at leadership, like I, I work with a company like Amazon, for example, I got a, a great client, been with him for four years in that company, and, and he's a, a great leader. And some of the things that we've talked about is the fact that, like, th there's this mentality around he has to make the final decision. And he's always like, how do I get him to buy into it? And I go, you help them, have them help you build it. They buy into what they help build, right? So if we can get an idea of well, here's what the end destination is, yeah, you'll make the final choice. And there will be people that have to disagree and commit to it. But if you get some people to buy in, what happens is when things can push come to shove, they'll protect it the same way you would by their actions, by their effort, by the team. Hey, guys, let's get together. Like, you don't even got to call them to come. They'll come together. And so I think bringing people into the fold to help you build the plan helps the plan come to life way better. That's great. Okay, third question. Is there something that you are doing this year to drive your own personal growth that you're excited about? Yeah, it's it's mostly shrinking <laughs> physically. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I've, I've always been a guy that's been in some kind of shape, you know, and, and I think the pandemic really pushed me to the edge of like being, I was fat, man. I had like, <laughs> I was 50, I was bad. And then I've been on this idea of like, I want to, I want to, for the first time in my life had genuine, like showing abs. Like I've always had a strong core, but even in football, we weren't like shredded, like we're not bodybuilders, we're athletes. So we still have fat in the body. And this year I'm like, man, I'm turning 40. I want to be shredded at 40. Like I really want to, for the first time in my life, just be shredded. So that's a whole journey um, that in and of itself makes me have to grow because I have to lose the excuses of I'm working this, I'm training these people, I have my kids, I train them, I help my wife, or I got this thing going on. I really have to dial in the food, have to dial in the supplementation, have to dial in the, the recovery work because I don't recover like I used to mm -hmm. and the training itself. And so that forces me to have to grow because the rest of the company, our goals won't slow down. It's the same thing as I, I look at it kind of like a lot of people want to have this amazing success at a high level. And if you think about like holding weights, we'll call it, there's weight that comes with that. And if, if for some reason you go, I can't hold this, you put it down, but you never get to experience what happens above that level. You're stuck yep. there. So for me, I, I want to stack the weights and as opposed to putting it down, go, all right, breathe into it and go, okay, how do I normalize this to where this is light? Because when it's light, I can handle more. So for me, I want to see how much I could handle this year, bring into my life with the, the ability to realize I'm trying to normalize to it, not go crazy so that years from now I can handle more. We do have that one picture on your website where you're jacked. I don't know what well, you're weighing jacked, on that one, but man. I was like 240, but it was yeah. all, that's my job, dude. Like when your job <laughs> is to work out like three, four hours a day, you better be big or you're doing something wrong. <laughs> uh, you got to be to play that game too. So, yeah, um, okay. Fourth question. What is outside of your own, what is the one book you've recommended most to other entrepreneurs, Ooh. leaders? You know, to other entrepreneurs, there's one that I recommend to people that I run into. And this, I think entrepreneurs and leaders can and should reread this often. But it's The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Covey. I, I, when I first got into this world, I read Man's Search for Meaning and, and that Stephen Covey book. And Man's Search for Meaning was good from the concept of like the parable and you learn about it and the meaning. It wasn't really a parable. It was more of like this guy in this yep. camp and local therapy and stuff. It's a good story. And I go, man, it's a great way to intro someone to the world of, of trying to do better. But then I didn't have like a working model to 
to operate from in real life. Like uh, like the Bible gives you operational structure about how to live a good life, right? Entrepreneurially interacting with people, like you don't always have that. So this book was a great foundation of like, good. all right, good. seek first to understand before you go understood. Like I'm like, all right, well, that makes more sense in sales and my marriage, like little principles, right? Or start with the end in mind. Don't just start randomly going somewhere. Like these little things you think aren't big, but for me, it's a good book to go back to often and go, am I doing this? Because when you do it in practice, you have some great success. That's good. It's a great one. Classic. Okay. Final, final question. What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Ooh, the best piece of advice. It takes a little more to be a champion. Hmm. This came from a college coach named Dom Pelham. And there, there's this idea that we all have in our head of like doing a lot and working as hard as I can. And I realized that as hard as I can may not be the level my dream desires or demands. And so whenever I look at like what I'm trying to do, champions play the level outside the norm. And the norm for most people is to stop at a certain point, typically where you feel like stopping. And then what you don't do is just try to go crazy for a day. It's not how it works. It's you do a little bit more every day, a little bit more than you're used to doing. And you stretch that. And if your consistent effort is to do a little bit more every day, eventually you've gone so much farther past where most people go that they can't reach you. They can't beat you, which means you're the champion. Mm -hmm. So I always look at like when I have uh, the, the end of the night, and I, I want to go to bed. But there's one thing I'm supposed to do. Like, no, it takes a little more to be a champion. Or if I, I have I feel prepared for the speech and I know I got to dial in like, no, it takes a little more to be a champion. Go one more time, man. So I do these little things. It may take me five or ten more minutes of that focused mental energy. But I think having done that for years has allowed me to fast track my success, but also stay successful and stay in, in mind of, of what's going on and what's most important for my life. Great, great advice. Uh, takes a little bit more to be a champion. I like that. Anthony, enjoyed the time today. I'm glad we finally got to connect. What yeah, is, too. what's the best way for people to stay connected to you? Uh, yeah. Social media, but however you, you do that. So yeah, if you go to um, Instagram, man, at Anthony trucks, it's the, fastest way to find me. I'm most present on there. Uh, although I may not post a bunch of stories, I do go in there and communicate on the, the messages fairly often. All right, go check them out. Your podcast is great too. So they should be listening to that. So, and uh, if you enjoyed this episode, make sure you make sure you're following along. So you get notified when we have new ones, but also make sure that you share it with someone who you think would benefit from this. So Anthony, again, my friend, I appreciate the time and uh, best of luck to you. Thank you too.